Thanks very much. Uh, today I'd like to tell you about uh, a couple of the projects going on in my group. Um, feel free to ask questions uh, during the talk if you like. Uh, so uh, it, it, my work is motivated by um, a standard paradigm in science and engineering, which is that you know we see things out in the world and we try to observe them, somehow standardize and codify what we see to turn it into some kind of understanding. And uh, you know, we can call that analysis. And if that understanding is powerful enough, we can build some sort of model or theory. Um, and that allows us to make predictions and to engineer new things that work by the same principles but might look quite different. And whereas the first leg might be termed analysis, this leg uh, is design. It's actually making something new based on maybe the principles of something old. And that's how mechanics in physics has turned into mechanical engineering and chemistry has turned into chemical engineering um, and the electricity and magnetism end of physics has turned into electrical engineering. Um, and so in biology, we'd like to take our understanding and make it powerful enough that we can do biological engineering, that we can actually change biological systems as conveniently as we design new chips or build bridges. Um, and in all of those other fields, there's a critical role for building models. And just in those other fields, those models will probably be built on principles from physics, chemistry, and especially biology. They will probably be mechanistic, which means they, they uh, are capable of making predictions because they have the right explanation built inside for how they work. Um, meaning that not only do they explain the data that we have and do they interpolate amongst the data that we have, but they're true at such a deep level that they're likely to extrapolate to changes that are very far away from where we are now. And that's important if you're trying to make a drug that will intervene in the human body and change it dramatically. Even if you've parameterized your models with a, with a normal person, it may not describe accurately enough how to move from a sick state uh, all the way to a different normal state unless it's built on the right mechanistic explanation. And then in order to actually do all of this stuff usefully, mathematical and computational approaches are important to be able to propagate those models. Design often uh, includes a certain amount of optimization and so to be able to carry out optimization on those models. And this is a theme that underlies just about everything that we do in my group. So today I'd like to specifically tell you about just two stories um, that have been going on for some time in the group. Um, one is at the molecular level, the design of enzyme inhibitors, and uh, the other is at the network level to try to understand what might make a good drug target and what might make a less good target um, for a therapeutic intervention and how modeling can be used in these places. Um, when I first started a group, probably about 20 years ago, I was very interested in the problem of what made a good binder. So if this is a protein receptor, and this is something that's supposed to be an inhibitor for it, why would it leave solvent and bind tightly? What are the physical principles and how do you turn those physical principles into something that you can use algorithmically in design? And everybody's always known that it's important that molecules have complementary shapes so that they can fit together in binding. 
And uh, one of the things that we discovered early on is that it's just as important that they have complementary charge distributions. That there's a balance between what a ligand pays in being desolvated, in leaving solvent, and what it gets back in interactions in the bound complex. And that in many theories of solvation, the linear response basis of those theories turns this into a very simple optimization problem that can be solved. And so you can literally solve for the best charge distribution to paint into a potential binding molecule and uh, so that it will bind as tightly as possible to a receptor. So that the trade-off of what it pays in being desolvated upon binding and what it gets back in interactions in the bound state together are as favorable as possible. And um, when we did this, it was just a bunch of equations and some sort of physics. And so we went and looked at natural biological systems and we saw that if we started with a very tight binding complex, the complex between the enzyme bar nace and its inhibitor bar star, it's one of the tightest binding complexes known in nature. And um, the theory we developed could explain the, uh, the entire charge distribution at the binding interface. The, um, the most highly charged residues were the ones that the theory predicted needed to be as highly charged as possible. The polar residues were the ones that the theory predicted should be polar. And the hydrophobic residues the theory predicted to be hydrophobic. Um, and uh, so that suggests that it's a useful explanation. Um, whether it would be useful for design or not, we looked at in, uh, an inhibitor to uh, the enzyme charismate mutase. This is a transition state analog that uh, had been designed about 15 years earlier. And in those intervening 15 years, no one had been able to make a tighter binding version of it. And we compared its charge distribution to this optimum that we would compute from physical principles and saw that it was deficient. Um, it was far from the optimum in one region that mattered the most. We suggested a small chemical change that would make it much closer to the optimum. And that was synthesized and produced uh, what I believe is still the tightest binding inhibitor to um, to charismate mutase. Uh, it's about a kcal or a kcal and a half uh, uh, higher affinity, depending on exactly the context in, in which you test it. And so this is just showing that there's sort of a connection between physical principles, modeling, understanding, and design um, that, that comes about and, and can be exploited. So since that time, we've got interested in doing more complex designs um, for looking at more larger problems. And the problem I wanted to tell you about is, um, is drug resistance through target mutation. So we have lots of therapies against infectious agents, viruses and bacteria and against cancer, and they tend to work for a little while, and then they don't work anymore because the target, the thing that they bind to, mutates and evolves. And mutates in a way where the target still does its job, it's still able to function, but it's no longer susceptible to the drug that's been synthesized against it, and so the drug is useless. And the problem we wanted to work on is how do you design something against a mutating target so that it binds not only to the version of the target that you have in front of you today, but let's pretend everything it might ever mutate to. And if you can't solve it for everything it might mutate to, maybe you'll make something that will last for three to five years for a patient instead of three to five months, which is often the way it is nowadays. And so there's sort of two approaches you might use to that problem. 
you might try to guess everything that it might mutate to and then do some huge massively parallel design that, that uses all that knowledge. Um, and uh, we consider that and we've put that aside and we chose a, a, a much simpler problem and the problem we, we chose was to use a trick basically. And the trick that we used is that almost all of these targets are enzymes. And the key thing about an enzyme is that it can't mutate to everything and still function. If it doesn't turn over its substrate, that infectious disease is no longer infectious. And that cancer is no longer cancerous. The reason these things are drug targets is that their function is essential. And if you turn off their function, they're dead. And so no matter what it mutates to, these enzymes will still turn over, will still catalyze, will still react with their substrates. And so can we use that trick to do something useful? So we chose HIV protease as, a, as an example because it's, a, it's one of the earliest cases where we have enough information to really study this problem. We know not only what the virus looked like when it was sort of first became apparent what it was, but we also have x-ray structures and sequences for what it's mutated to in response to therapies that have been introduced into hospitals. And there are actually databases that list the sequences <clears throat> from patients that have been treated with different antivirals and you can see the emergence of resistance through the development of different classes of mutations depending on the antiviral treatment that was given to the patient. So we've been involved in a collaboration with biophysicists and synthetic chemists. One of our collaborators, Celia Schiffer at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, solved the crystal structure of um, the enzyme in complex with a number of its substrates. HIV protease cleaves uh, at least 10 different polypeptides. And so this is the structure of the protease with five different peptides bound, all five of those structures superimposed. The protease cleaves a bond, because uh, of the coloring it's hard, but right there. That's the peptide bond that gets cleaved. Um, and um, what's interesting is that the side chains all occupy about the same volume, the side groups of the substrate. And just uh, for example, right over here, this area is filled either by a long side chain that shows up over here and a short ch side chain here, or by a long one from there, and a short one over there. So it's not sequence conservation, but it's an element of structural conservation instead. And so um, it became apparent that <coughs> one could, <coughs> because the substrates all occupy a common volume, any inhibitor that poked outside of that volume presents an opportunity for the enzyme. If, if there's a part of my inhibitor out here, the enzyme can mutate in a way to interact poorly with my inhibitor but still bind substrates. And so from this observation came the substrate envelope hypothesis. That if we made a substrate that bound tightly but lived and bound entirely within the envelope of this group of substrates that it would be very difficult for the virus to evolve resistance to it. It's a hypothesis. We don't know if it's true or not. Um, but that was where we started. And it's a, a class of the larger hypothesis, which is that if you can be as similar to substrate as possible, 
uh, it's hard for the virus to evolve resistance, and this just brings it down to a shape similarity, because that's the, sim that's the most obvious similarity that we see among the substrates. So uh, in order to test this hypothesis, we uh, needed some algorithms. So I know there are some computer science people in the audience. And, um, so uh, there are lots of algorithms for designing drugs. We uh, had to make our own because uh, uh, that's the kind of people we are. Um, but but, but uh, the, the ones we developed have some special properties that make it useful in general and particularly useful for this problem. So uh, in our algorithm, like many others, you start with the active site and a bunch of fragments, chemical fragments, that can be synthesized into targets. And our fragments are all things that can be bought in chemical, um, on the web, <laughs> at uh, chemical companies. Um, there's some cute algorithmic tricks in the middle that make it feasible and outcome things that are synthesizable and that sh are predicted to bind tightly to the target. I'm not going to say too much about the algorithm except a couple of things. First, it's built on guaranteed discrete search methods like dead-end elimination and the A-star algorithm that are, uh, were first used in protein design problems. In protein design, typically they're used in cases where there's a fixed backbone and side chains that are variable in structure and conformation. And inhibitors work the same way. Often there's a core or a scaffold that's held constant and then variable and conformationally flexible side groups around it. And so the same types of algorithms can be applied. They're really only powerfully applicable when the underlying energy description model is pairwise linear. And the best models that we have are not actually pairwise linear. And so um, that presents a, a problem. Uh, many people make a, approximations of the model that are pairwise linear. Um, what we've chosen to do is a little different. First, the combination of uh, um, dead end elimination and A star allows you to get an ordered list from the best to the second best to the third best and the fourth best up as high as you want of the predicted tightest binders with your pairwise additive energy function that may or may not be that accurate. Um, and because you have everything in, the, say, the lowest 10 kcals per mole or something, you can then resort those with a better, more expensive energy function and sort them again with an even more accurate, with your most accurate energy function. And because you haven't missed anything in the ordered list, as long as there's pretty good correlation between the different energy functions, you can actually get the best three to five kcals per mole with your best energy function to, um, uh, with statistical guarantees of, uh, of completeness. And um, that's very powerful for us. Our best energy function incorporates continuum electrostatics. It's a linear response model of solvation that's shown to be quite accurate for um, calculating desolvation interactions, which we know from past work is very important for getting the electrostatics of binding uh, correct. And then to make it all affordable, because all of the functional groups can be in any confirmation. Um, we pre-compute most of the potentials on a grid and store them. And then for any placement of any molecular fragment, you basically um, look up on, onto the grid um, its interactions and, uh, and, and pull them and, and interpolate them off of a grid. And uh, that makes it that makes it computable together with the algorithms buried in here. Um, the rest of it's pretty cheap. Um, so we can routinely run in a weekend on a small cluster. 
uh, a fairly large design problem, and I'll, I'll show you the sort of size of the search space uh, in, in the next few slides. So uh, this is useful in lots of different ways. Uh, early on, one of the things we did was we were trying to decide which of a number of different chemical parallel synthetic schemes our synthetic collaborators were considering would produce good libraries. And so without, without trying to get very accurate, we just tried to do pilot work with a few different libraries and ask how do they do in the site. And this is a library that's based very closely on peptides. And you can see that in the site, it's able to stick groups into all four directions. And this has more chemical diversity, but because of sort of the, the angles at which the variable groups come off of the scaffold, it, it can really only fill well two of the four pockets. And it only reaches a little bit in this direction and only a little bit in this direction. And so we could fairly rapidly early on eliminate certain libraries that probably weren't going to yield anything good at all and focus on things that were um, more likely to produce um, good binders. So the library that we settled on is uh, very similar to a, a, a class of known inhibitors of which Imprenovir and Darunavir are two examples. And uh, uh, this is what it, um, uh, Imprenovir looks like. Our library uh, has, this is the scaffold, a constant phenyl ring here, constant hydroxyl, constant amide, a variable group here, a variable group here, and a third variable group there. Um, and it doesn't make exactly Imprenovir. In place of this oxygen, it would put a carbon. So in the synthesis, the R1 group gets introduced from a carboxylic acid. And we went to the libraries and found, you know, uh, the catalogs and found 2,327 carboxylic acids that would be feasible in this reaction. The variability here comes from a primary amine, and we found almost 400 of those. And variability in the last position comes in from a sulfonyl chloride, and we found almost 300 of those. So if you multiply all those together, it's about a quarter of a billion molecules. And because of the conformational search that we do, it's about 1 50th of a mole of structures. Um, we don't actually evaluate each structure. The dead end elimination search is able to prune the search tree uh, without uh, fairly high up without actually evaluating every leaf. So we get the guarantees of having searched um, almost a mole of structures. So the design started coming out and uh, you know one of the criteria was that they not exceed the substrate envelope, which is this sort of yellowy shape here in the background. And the kinds of molecules that come out are able to fill most of the volume because of the constraints of chemistry. They're not able to, to reach the envelope on all frontiers, but they get very close. Um, we were afraid we might get small molecules that sort of lived in the middle and didn't reach out very far to the edges. So that was a nice sign. And um, we started designing libraries that could be synthesized combinatorially from the fragments that <coughs> recurred often in our best compounds. And so this is a 36 member library that has six groups at the R1 position, crossed with three groups at this R2 position, and two more groups at the last position. And when it was synthesized, these are the binding affinities in nanomolar. And so the, you know, all compounds bind well. The weakest compound was four nanomolar, and the best one was 14 picomolar. <coughs> and a third of the compounds, 12, 
were um, better than 100 picomolar. This is a well-studied target. Uh, the library was based on a, a, a compound that's, that's known to bind well. So this is good, but uh, it's hard to say how, how good it is and how one would do on a naive problem. But it's sufficient to allow us to go on and ask the next set of questions. So the crystal structures of a number of these molecules were solved and not only were they predicted to bind in this substrate envelope, but they actually do bind in that substrate envelope. Every single one that was solved binds essentially in the substrate envelope as we had wanted them to. And, uh, oh, we are missing one of the guns. Right, okay. Um, <coughs> The sort of interesting question is to experimentally measure their affinity not only against wild type, but now against mutants. And so these are four very common combinations of mutants that occur in response to common inhibitors that are given to patients infected with the HIV virus. And what's the important column is here. This is the worst fold loss. So here, the M3 mutant is about tenfold worse than wild type. And here, um, it's the M4 mutant is about 34-fold worse than wild type. And so what you can see is that we were successful in that many of the compounds bind, you know, only lose about tenfold to maybe up to 50-fold compared to wild type. Tenfold's not bad, um, 50 folds not so bad, but not great. But this isn't the whole story. Some of the compounds were pretty successful. Others were not. So here are compounds from the same set. To the extent that we have structures, and we only have a few, they seem to bind in the substrate envelope. But now we're losing over a hundredfold um, in binding affinity to some of the mutants. Yes? Uh, uh, maybe I don't understand properly, but uh, you are testing it uh, against uh, mutants uh, that occur in response to common inhibitors. Right. Not, not, to, uh, not in oh, response to... Oh, excellent question. Are... Good question. Right. So the, the question is um, that are these the right inhibitors? Because these inhibitors came from patients that saw other drugs. Even if we were successful, even if we say, ah, tenfold, this one should be good, that doesn't fully validate our hypothesis because maybe if I gave this, this inhibitor to a patient, um, another mutation that we've never seen before might come up. So uh, we've done a couple things. One is, this is only four inhibitors. Uh, they're actually companies where you can send your compounds to and they'll test them against 400 uh, 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 mutants. I think I said inhibitors. Mutants. Um, but th they're also in mutants from viruses that have never seen this. And some of these compounds do fine against all 400. So the real question is, um, and we have a collaborator who's doing this, but the results aren't really in yet, is you grow virus on human culture, on human cells in culture, un under selective pressure. And the selective pressure you apply is our inhibitor. And then you look at the sequence of virus after significant time in passages, and ask what mutations have arised, have arisen, and then what's the binding constant, what's the inhibition constant to that virus. We don't have that result yet, but we have that collaborator, and that collaborator is trying to do that experiment. That turns out to be a very difficult experiment for some reason. But it's not possible to do it computationally, to predict mutancies that will occur. Um, we haven't really looked at the problem. You could certainly work on that problem. How accurate you would be uh, remains to be seen. 
And it's very difficult experimentally to produce all possible evolutionary traces that could happen. So evolution is a stochastic event, right? So if I predicted amino acid preferences, I would say it's just as likely that we had uh, D amino acids as L amino acids, the chirality of the amino acids. But if you looked at the data, I'd be completely wrong. The data says that only one of those occurred. And it's because it's you know, stochastic selection and amplification. So in some sense, I'd only work on that problem if I had an experimental system where someone could produce the vast majority of, exper uh, of evolutionary pathways. And if I pick the third best one, I'd like to know that it was the third best one rather than it was not the one. Um, good. So, uh, so it's curious to me why the, the, the principle works sometimes, but not all the time. And it suggests, obviously, that there are many ways of being like substrate and fitting in the volume is only one of them. And maybe there are other ways of being like substrate that we need to learn about. And maybe even being like substrate is not, a, is, is not sufficient. It might be helpful, but not sufficient. So uh, we have a lot more work to do here. Um, some of that work we've done, and uh, uh, this is not directly useful for that, but one of the things we noticed is that um, our energetic resolution wasn't very good. So the things that we said would be the best binders were good binders, but they weren't the best binders. So our, 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 our accuracy wasn't very good once we found good binders. And the reason that matters is that collaborators are very happy to go back and do more synthesis if you have better ideas. And we didn't know if we had any better ideas because our, 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 our error range was too large. So uh, of all the sort of good inhibitors that we would predict, we weren't confident that the one with the lowest energy was actually going to be better. So we wanted to get more accurate estimates of the energy. And we knew that we weren't doing the physics right. The correct physics is to calculate the free energy of binding over a statistical mechanical ensemble that has lots and lots and lots of confirmation that fully uh, uh, examines the configurational space of the ligand and the protein and the unbound and the bound state. And we didn't do that. We did what everybody does. You get the best structure of the complex and you calculate some sort of energy of docking those two pieces together. You might have a deformation energy for some conformational change between the unbound and the bound state. So some of the same approaches can be used to actually create the entire um, configurational space on some grid. And um, my laser's dying. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> and so uh, this is just a, uh, thank you. Uh, this is just an illustration of s some members of that um, ensemble overlaid uh, for illustrative purposes. And the same algorithms can be used to actually do that. In sort of one step, we, um, on a grid, examine all possible conformations and poses of just the scaffold in the active site. And then in another step, we examine all the rotomeric variation of the side groups and collect the ensemble from there uh, for each of the accepted poses. Uh, and that allows us, if this is sort of the energy as a function of conformational space, it allows us to collect in a sampled format all the low energy structures. So we don't collect the whole configurational space. We could never afford that. 
but we can selectively just fill up from the bottom and only collect the good part. And, uh, and then you just do the statistical mechanics and you're all set. So, uh, oh, and there's one more trick I'm not going to tell you about. <coughs> oh, I know what I wanted to say though. And the, the real question is, can you collect enough so that the free energy converges? And this is the unbound state, which is the one that has more freedom. And uh, the free energy may have converged. The enthalpy and the entropy are harder to get to converge. And uh, it looks like at the end, they're getting awfully close. Um, so if they haven't converged yet, in another year or two, we should have enough computer power to make them converge. Uh, everybody always says that. Uh, so this was our original calculation before we did this ensemble treatment. This is the calculational free energy of binding. Uh, and, and this is the experimental. And the absolute values, only differences matter. Um, and, and you can see the, you know, the line, if it was a line, has the wrong slope. Um, and so we don't really have such good discrimination. And this thing that's computed to be much worse is actually in the middle of the pack. And the spread here, we miss entirely. So uh, we did a, a few different versions, uh, and, and, and they're all better. Uh, I'll show you the best one. When we actually compute delta G, the right thing, um, there's uh, some uh, uncertainty in the experiments. Um, and the, but the average experimental number and the computed number uh, have excellent correlation. The slope of this line still isn't one, so we don't have everything figured out yet. And, and other, uh, most people have that same problem that we have <coughs> as well. But what I like about this is that as you get the physics better, your results get better. And that suggests, again, that you, you have the right mechanism in there someplace. If you actually make the physics better and your results get worse, you have to worry about whether you're, why you're getting the right results. <laughs> okay, um, so, you know, we claimed that the reason that these things bind well is that they, um, they fit inside the substrate envelope and that that's important. But um, we based it on this compound in Prenovir and Darunavir. Darunavir actually is a pretty uh, robust flat binder. It binds well to a lot of mutants. So someone who doesn't like us could argue, well, you just started with a good scaffold and that's why your compounds are good. It's got nothing to do with that substrate envelope. And the easiest way we could think of to address that question no one asked it because everyone, everyone's our friend in science. But, um, but we wanted to, to, to show it to ourselves is that if I could make a change that would cause the molecule, actually that's not one of the variable groups, if I could make a change that would cause the molecule to poke outside the substrate envelope, there's a specific prediction that that should lead to worse binding to um, to some of the mutants. And if I could poke out just a little bit, I should still bind well to wild type and only bind poorly to some of the mutants. So that's what we decided to try to do. Um, so this is uh, two parent compounds, AD93 and KB83. And um, th this is the substrate envelope. And they basically bind inside. There's this, uh, I think it's carbonyl, if it's, it's red. Um, and uh, and it's, it sticks out a little tiny bit. Uh, this is the compound that had that worst full binding loss of 10. And, and this one had the worst full binding loss of 41. I think because of that carbonyl, they're computed to stick outside um, less than 10 cubic angstroms, which is much less than a methyl group. And um, the calculation suggested that if we changed what had been an aliphatic group here to this long and then aromatic group, it would stick out and uh, 
I think it's just because of where I'm standing. It might be the colors, but um, uh, this is sticking out by one whole atom and two fractional atoms, and the same thing here. And so now, now it's sticking out by at least uh, 20 or 30 cubic angstroms, and the worst fold loss goes up from 10 to, 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 uh, to 98, so it's about 10 fold worse, and from 41 to, to 274, so maybe that's five or six or something fold worse. Um, and so that's support of this notion that if you poke outside the substrate envelope, you interfere with binding some of the mutants. And it's not surprising the mutants you interfere with are the ones that are in this region of the chain. And it's just another view of the same thing. So that's the first story that I wanted to tell you. Uh, and we still have some work to do there, and we still haven't figured out what other parts of substrate similarity are especially important so that you only design things that bind tightly to the wild type and its mutants. Um, but we're still working on that. Uh, but this notion of substrate similarity um, leads to an enrichment in, in the design of robust binders. So I wanted to talk about ne network modeling, and I've used up more than half of my time, so I'm going to tell this one faster. An important problem when you have a, a sort of a pathway that has some input and a bunch of chemical reactions <coughs> with intermediate species and then some output is how do I change the signal propagation from input to output? And let's just be very simple-minded today and say, how do I turn off the output? Many diseases are due to over-signaling and over-stimulation. Many cancers, uh, all cancers are believed to fall into that category where cells are told to divide that shouldn't be. And in, in this sort of diagram, you would think any place that I could break the chain would work except for these four. Right, and if I could do two of these together, this one and that one, or this one and that one, I, they should all work. And, um, and, and so a lot of what the drug industry thinks about is which one's easiest. And easiest, they think of in structural terms, and they actually try to see which enzyme might have a deep active site that uh, has polar groups that would lead to a good drug a drug with good pharmacokinetic properties and good bioavailability. And, and we took a very different perspective on that. And we said, well, you know, they're not all the same, I, I bet. I bet they're not all the same because the characteristics of the signal change as you move down here. And if you want to turn off the output, you may have to squeeze a lot harder at some places than at other places. And we'd like to find out whether that was true or not. And so, uh, which places are better? And if I had more power, I didn't just have inhibitors to, to turn things off, but I could actually, oops, build some sort of feedback circuit that would do something intelligent. Maybe I could even have more control over this network. How I'd get that into a person and get it approved is a, another problem, but that would be an interesting question. So, um, if signal propagation were linear, if it obeyed some superposition principle, let's just pretend that the width of this is the strength of the signal, and the distance from top to bottom is sort of how far down the network I've traveled topologically. Well, any inhibitor that blocked off a quarter of the signal no matter top, middle, or bottom, would automatically turn off a quarter of the output. Not because these are straight lines, but because the signal propagation is linear. A quarter is a quarter at the top, the middle, and the bottom. And in a linear network, half inhibition at the top, or the middle, or the bottom, would turn off half the output. And three quarters would give you three quarters. But because the binding steps in 
biological reactions are bilinear, bimolecular, bilinear, and the Mike Yellis Menten reaction has a nonlinear form, has a nonlinear regime to it. Biology is, it is not strictly linear. It might be gently nonlinear. Um, and so anything can happen. So, I, oh, this is hard to see, but I could be unlucky. And I turn off half the signal right here, and I just turn off a tiny bit of the output. Well then, this would be a terrible place to inhibit if this was how my network worked. Uh, or I, I could be, there's one more, oh yeah, I could be very lucky. This spot right here, I turn off one-fifth of the signal, and I turn off all the output. Well, if that exists, I'd love to find that. So it'd be nice to know where we live in this space. So, uh, uh, we had to get very concrete. So the question we're asking is, as I add more and more inhibitor, and I inhibit more and more of a target, how does that affect the output? So, if things were linear, I said when I inhibit half the target, I turn off half the output. They might be sublinear, the bad way. I turn off half the target, but I only turn off about 10% of the output. Or they, they might be superlinear, that might be the good way. I turn off half the target, but I turn off almost all of the output. So, how does it work? So we chose one of the best studied and best modeled networks in biology. This is signaling downstream from the epidermal growth fact factor receptor. So ligand, we used epidermal growth factor, binds to the receptor, dimerizes, is activates through cross-phosphorylation, and through a series of adapters, transmits signal down into a canonical MAP kinase cascade that results in the activation of RAF that goes on to activate MEC that goes on to activate ERK and we're calling activated ERK the output of the network for now and that's a, a stand-in the real output is cell proliferation or something like that um, and uh, there are a number of models that have been developed for this um, and uh, we've used a, a version of that these are ordinary differential equation based models that propagate signal down uh, from some uh, step increase in the um, input down through to the output and uh, so just for framing we have an input we have an output Upstream signals are everything above the MAP kinase cascade, and the downstream signals are just uh, these species in this lower block. So what's shown here is the amount of signal at four different places in the network, uh, at the top, uh, and then uh, the three downstream levels, for increasing amounts of input. A, it's a step change in the, in the epidermal growth factor. Each line is tenfold more uh, ligand input present. And what you can see is that um, the network saturates, even though there's a tenfold change in the input and a tenfold change in the input and tenfold, tenfold, tenfold change in the input, all these lines are superposed. So it's, it saturates. That's a property of nonlinear networks that linear networks don't do. So uh, we can see that slight nonlinearity um, uh, has an effect in the regime that we're looking in. And uh, so we did our thing. And this is what the curves look like for every single one of the upstream signals. We looked at, at, at each of the molecules up there. And, um, they're dramatically sublinear. You have to inhibit more than 90% of any species up at the top to have even a visible effect on the output. And uh, there have been experiments done on targeting the receptor itself 
and uh, they match this curve extremely well. If you go to the downstream signals, RAF has just about the same problem. It's a little bit better. MEC and ERC, the output and the thing just before the output, are better. They're slightly super linear. So the answer to our question is it really matters. There are te terrible places and some reasonable places, maybe no great places. And the problem is no one actually wants to cure normal cells. Normal cells are normal. You want to cure cancerous cells. So we built sort of three models for cancer that involve increasingly overstimulated networks. See, normal is this one here. Uh, this type 1 cancer um, has too large a signal that decays too slowly. And type 2 and type 3 are models that uh, stimulate too far and stay stimulated for much, much, much too long. You can't even see them decrease on this scale. These are changes we made to the network model based on very common mutations found among many cancers. The first one is an overstimulation of the receptor itself, overexpression of the receptor. Um, and the next two are um, versions of mutations in RAS or RAF that cause them to um, deactivate too slowly once they've been activated. And uh, now if you study those, <coughs> uh, the type 1 model is a lot like the normal cell. The more aggressive forms, you can see it's really not worth targeting the receptor. RAF's pretty bad. MEC that used to be okay is now awful and only the output is any good at all. And the type 3 cancer is even more aggressive, and the same thing is true. Um, and so, uh, you know, we found this extraordinarily interesting because it suggests that um, it really matters where you design your inhibitor against, what you choose as your target. And um, we did it with a modeling study, but you could do this with experiments. You could say, oh, the model may not be that accurate. Maybe there are other things. There are certainly supposed to be crosstalk in these networks, and there isn't crosstalk in this model. But the, the point is still the point, that the, that the subtle nonlinearities existent in biochemical networks are likely to cause different levels of the network to have very different amounts of control over the output of that network. And one should choose carefully based not only on what might allow you to make a good inhibitor, but what might actually have sufficient control over the output to make it worth making an inhibitor too. Um, okay, that was the conclusion. Uh, we've done a little bit of work saying what could you do if you could build a fancy circuit. And I think I'll just sort of show you the results because I'm out of time. Um, yeah, let's just skip all that. So here's an example where um, we have an enzyme that reads the signal at MEC, and if it's too strong, MEC itself is a kinase, so it phosphorylates our thing, and the phosphorylated form of our therapeutic um, acts as a phosphatase and deactivates ERK. And so what this does is takes a, a normal cell. Ooh, the colors are changing. Cool. Um, this is the signal from, from normal in the dotted line. And it produces almost a normal output. And the cancer model, the da da dashed black line, uh, still gets stimulated. We optimized it to try to produce the normal output, the dotted green line. But um, it's a little too strong. And so this still gives a slight preference to cancer cells, but it's nothing like the level of overstimulation that we saw in the untreated case. Um, the other one we looked at, instead of trying to make the cancer look normal, we tried to turn it off. 
And um, it's actually the same sort of topology and just a different set of rate constants that uh, produces a much stronger signal forward. Um, and uh, in this case, the normal gets attenuated somewhat, but probably enough to still cause the right cells to divide at the right time. And the cancer still generates a signal, but it's a pretty tiny signal, and then it trails off. And while you can try to do this sort of thing with small molecules, and you can to some extent, what you find is that when you do it with small molecules, it only works for exactly the rate constants that you chose. And if you vary the rate constants by even a little bit, it doesn't work at all. Whereas if you use enzymology to do this, it's robust over wide ranges of parameters. Um, so I'm just going to finish by uh, uh, saying that you know, it really matters where you target in a network. And if someday we learn to make therapeutics that are not just binders, but are actually catalysts that can do things, and we can actually wire circuitry, if you will, into cells, um, we can do a lot more sensing and responding. Um, and that might be much more powerful uh, for future therapeutics. And I want to just uh, end there by thanking the people that did the work. Um, uh, the, the, the work on HIV protease has been a team that's been going for some time. Michael Altman, Nate Silver, Bracken King, and Yang Shen. And this is our team of collaborators. Um, Celia's group does biophysical characterization and crystallography. Tarek's group does uh, synthesis. Uh, Michael Gilson's a, another theorist that's worked in collaboration with us. And the work on targeting was all done by Nirmala Powdell. I want to thank uh, these people for funding and you for your kind attention. Thank you. Please. Uh, uh, in the first part of your talk, you uh, said about combinatorial circuits. Uh, and it was uh, big enough, like 10 to the 22. Uh, what uh, tools do you, what algorithmic tools do you use? Just, uh, you just do it uh, yourself or you use uh, some uh, tools like uh, satisfiability solvers or something like that? Right. So the this dead end elimination algorithm thing is basically a branch and bound like search yes. that, um, that allows you to eliminate things that couldn't possibly be in your solution set. And that gets it small enough. Yes, but, uh, my question is, why can you uh, just uh, make uh, yet another version bound search or you use a general tool? Uh, oh, well, we've written the code ourselves, but the, the, this field of dead end elimination has been developed by 10 or 20 research groups over the past 30 years. And the things that are in our code are in everybody's code because they found that they worked. And they're, they're not so general uh, because of the specific tricks inside of proteins. They're not so general that you'd find them in a general computer science literature, but they're general in the protein design literature. So uh, you don't think that these specific tricks uh, can be translated into uh, formal language? Uh, That's a very good question. Uh, and I, I don't actually know the answer to that. So, you know, many people work on problems in some domain of interest, biology, nanotechnology, whatever, hoping to find general principles to advance a more fundamental field. So algorithm design might be advanced by finding quirks in the biology problems that makes you invent things that work well everywhere. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether that's the case here or not. I just haven't looked looked into it enough. I, I, I must say that I, I myself always uh, thought that 
uh, you always should uh, write your own program to make your own tricks and so on. I didn't believe this uh, satisfiability solver, so I took part in uh, mm -hmm. writing some of that. But uh, after all, uh, people uh, uh, persuaded me that, well, okay, uh, they are so optimized that once you are able to formulate your problem, oh, you it fits it, they will work better than your new Oh, orders. yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this doesn't fit into, into any known paradigm that I know of. There are other problems we work on where, um, you know, it's just a mixed integer linear program and, and we use standard packages for that or, you know, for a matrix diagonalization, there's no way that we would write our own. Um, this is just a little different. But if you think it's not, and you can point me to something, I would be very, very excited to see it. Well, it's not exactly branch and bound. That's the closest thing to it. It's if it were exactly branch and bound, we'd be all set. Please. Thank you very much for the I'm not a structural guy, so it might sound a little naive, but my understanding that one of the problems with docking is that, I mean nowadays, is that docking is done in, in steady. So we have a steady uh, you know, picture from the X-ray, we have a steady structure of negator, and you know, we're trying to combine them and see what happens, but in real life it might not be exactly the same. Right. And my understanding uh, was that most part of the presentation you were talking about steady, steady stuff. You had this part about the North American search and you know, exploring this conformational space, but it, it, it actually deals with a, a bit of dynamic in the inhibitor, in the ligand. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess the question is, uh, you talk about the target. The, the, mm -hmm. Is it feasible to try to apply some uh, target when it's so computationally exposed that it, it's just not feasible to be one of these? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So, um, so, so uh, I'd start by saying, what problem do you want to solve? Well, find the greatest inhibitor ever. Right. Good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so is docking? If you could be the best docker on the planet, would would that be good for solving that problem or not? Oh, I guess in part. Yeah. So the way you're asking it, it's probably I shouldn't say yes. But <laughs> no, no. I think that's the, that's perfect. Most of the world believes that that's the right way to that. That if you do one, you'll be good at the other. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I I chose the other path, and I, I I believe deeply that if you focus on only the part, the problem you want to solve, that um, that you'll do better than if you solve some other problem and hope that that's the way to solve your problem. And, and just as an example, you know, uh, to, to do docking right, you have to get not just the best compound right, but you have to get the bad compounds right too. Um, you actually have to figure out how it binds, not, not whether it can bind really, 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 really well. <laughs> Right? So, for example, I started with that electrostatic optimization thing. There's no docking in there. Y you, you take the site, you sort of fill it with sand, you throw some glue in there so the stand, sand sticks together, you pull it out, and then you have like a three-dimensional paintbrush and you paint charge distribution into it. There's no docking. If I can then find a molecule that has that shape and that charge distribution, I'd, I'd have solved the problem to its optimum without ever docking anything. And, 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 the, and I would have done it by an optimization step rather than a uh, uh, find how every molecule docks step. Also, even if you had the best docking algorithm, you'd actually have to run it on every single molecule. So uh, I, 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 I don't. I eliminate a lot of molecules before I make them. <laughs>
um, because I, I decide that they're not worth making because they're going to bind worse than this other molecule that I've already determined wasn't worth making. Um, so the dynamic is not such an issue here as it can be in Darwin? Well, so, so here's my thing. Um, do you want to find a really good molecule or do you want to find every molecule that might be good? And if, you're, if you want to cover the entire patent space, you have to find every molecule that might be good. I only want to find a few good ones, I decided. So if you start with one confirmation and you find a lot of things that bind well to that confirmation, and it's, like you say, it's rigid for the receptor. The ligand is allowed complete freedom in different, different ways. It's either given side chain, side group freedom, or complete freedom. Um, but the receptor, if you hold it completely fixed, there's only one of those. If you don't find anything, you failed. You have to try another one, and another one, and another one. If you find something really good, have you succeeded? And if you're only trying to find, you know, 10 or 50 good binders, it's, it's possible to do that. So how you, how you pick that first confirmation turns out to be important if that's the path you've taken. And um, usually there's a substrate analog bound because they're usually enzymes and you're usually targeting the active site. And so that path has been the path that we've always followed. In allowing the receptor freedom, there's, there are two issues. If you allow it fixed backbone and side groups in this discrete rhodomeric space, um, it's just a scale problem. The problem formulates the same and everything works the same and it just becomes more expensive. Um, if you want to vary the backbone, um, the formulation then breaks and you essentially can run the same algorithm once for every new confirmation of the backbone, but there's no way of intelligently doing them all together or leveraging knowledge from one backbone to the next one to the next one. And, um, and so people do brute force it that way, but, um, but there's a nice conceptual piece that's missing in how to actually chain those two problems together so that as you change the, the rigid piece, the backbone, all the work you've done can get used on the next backbone and the next backbone. Or that you can, you know, prune the tree for one backbone by using a different backbone. And, and, and no, one's, no one's had a conceptual advance that allows that to happen. So it's just a lot of running computers. Uh, there's a question here. Thank you. Why don't we care about the worst case, for example? So, um, I, th I missed the beginning about profiles. So, uh, y for the inhibitors, why don't we care about the bad binders? Mm, no. Why, for example, uh, one of the inhibitors has a bad value at the last column, but, but its absolute values were good. Uh, so, because the virus could choose that last column, could make that mutation, and um, you know, HIV samples every single amino acid mutation in the entire genome every day. Every day, I think it's every day in a human-sized person. Um, every day. So the inhibitor isn't going to last them. Some of them last six months, but you'd be lucky for six months. Um, and so um, the, 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 um, you know, the, the assumption is that if there's a if there's a possibility for a mutation to be bad, the organism will find it. And I, the same studies haven't been done for cancers yet, how, how quickly an aggressive cancer samples every mutation. 
uh, every single mutation, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was often enough to be uh, bad. Hmm. There must be more questions. Oh, please. Uh, and uh, my question is about the first part. Uh, when we were talking about that the scaffold uh, should bind to the specific part of the virus which shouldn't change. Like, uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, and when we're talking about the mutation of the virus, are uh, this mutation touches that, that part exactly or it has a mutation in other part? So uh, how the idea that the scaffold is, uh, should be static inside the mutation uh, uh, is the same for real mutations in the virus. Yeah, so, so you said some interesting things that many other people in the field have said, but, but I did not say. <laughs> so one of the things you said that was very interesting is that the constant part of the drug, the inhibitor, the scaffold, maybe should only touch constant parts of the virus. Parts that are you know, not allowed to mutate because they are the catalytic aspartates, or they're the backbone, and, and backbone can't mutate, it can move due to mutation, but it can't move. Um, and, uh, and, and, and many people have thought about it that way and framed the problem that way. Um, it, in HIV protease, there are, the resistance mutations are interesting and people haven't understood them all completely, but it seems that the first round of mutations that appear are close to the active site and knock out substrate binding and also diminish catalytic activity. So they do diminish catalytic activity. They weaken the virus. And in the absence of selective pressure, they would be selected against. And then the next round of mutations that appear tend to be further away. And their role is to bring back catalysis of substrates without changing lack of binding of inhibitors. And so they bring back catalysis, basically. Um, and uh, so I think to, relevant to your question is the point that many of the mutations are actually very close to the inhibitor. And part of what this look like substrate concept says is to apply the concept, you don't necessarily need to understand which contacts can mutate and which ones can't. So, Others have looked more closely at which parts are constant and which parts are variable. Interestingly, almost the whole thing is variable, but maybe not completely variable, in the sense that every position can mutate, but not to all 20 amino acids. Or close to every position can mutate, but not to all 20 amino acids. And so the, the pattern of what's constant and what's variable, I don't think has been figured out entirely. And likewise, the correlations that cause the shape to be the same, even though there might be multiple mutations, has not been worked out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this field, so excuse me if it's going to be stupid. There are no um, stupid questions. Um, do you use any quantum mechanics uh, in your simulations, for example, to simulate the bonds between molecules or is it uh, uh, pure uh, computer science? Good, good question. So uh, I think everything that I talked about today are models that are called molecular mechanics. And what they are is they uh, treat the bonds, for example, as harmonic oscillators. And the bond angles as harmonic oscillators. And the, the uh, torsional angles, with a sinusoidal potential. And they are uh, based on Linus Pauling's original conception of how to treat molecular degrees of freedom, 
what's stiff, what's soft, what interactions should be favored, and which ones are disfavored. They should fit very closely to quantum mechanics, but they, but they aren't. And they obviously can't treat bond making and bond breaking. When we have to parameterize a new molecule that we don't understand, that we don't know the parameters for, we often simulate it with quantum mechanics to derive its stiffness or its partial atomic charge distribution, and then take it out of the quantum mechanics and paste it onto this molecular mechanical model. Uh, in other work in my group, using methods developed by others, um, we study the reactions catalyzed by enzymes. So there you're breaking bonds and making bonds. And the typical way to do that is to have a part of the simulation that's quantum mechanics. And then you uh, interface it, you, you connect it to the rest that's this molecular mechanics, this ball and spring model. Um, so you get the accurate quantum mechanics where you need to break and make the bonds, and then you have the, the effect of the rest through um, essentially point charges interacting with the quantum, a field of point charges interacting with the quantum mechanics. And um, that's shown to be remarkably useful. Right, so this is a question of specificity. So if you only look at one protein, um, you know, maybe that inhibitor might bind to other proteins and cause side effects and be dangerous for patients. Um, or maybe you want it to cover two proteins. If you, uh, so in other work, but nothing here, we've looked at that, that question. And, um, you know, the general answer is that if you know what, you, <laughs> what the other protein is, you can study it too. And you can set up a multiple optimization where you want to bind to this but not bind to that. And there are very specific changes you would make to an inhibitor if you want to make it bind tighter to this and different changes you'd make if you want to make it bind tighter to this while also binding worse to that. There's sort of a different vector direction that you would walk in if you had a different objective. Um, the general problem, you don't know the other thing that it's going to bind to. And um, we don't have any special tricks there. There's a, a sort of general belief that if you bind tighter to your target, you're automatically going to be more specific. It's sort of more religion than science. Um, but I, I think a lot of specificity problems do go away as inhibitors get tighter and tighter, because then you can use less and less of the active compound, and that, that does tend to relieve problems. Uh, maybe my last question. Uh, what, what is the challenge you see in this field? Like, uh, what's the biggest challenge which will be solved, solved soon, five, ten years? Uh, five, ten years. Uh, that's a hard question. Yeah, I think the question of backbone motion treated in a systematic way is probably the one that has been on the horizon for a long time. And, and there's been a lot of advances in it, but in that fundamental way, not at all. So Fundamentally, it's still the same problem. Is there any hope that it will be solved? Uh, yeah. <laughs> The hope is in the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, something that is uh, on the verge of being solved is one of those things where uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have a strong sense of that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.